we start, I want to open with a prayer. Heavenly Father, without you, we can do nothing. Without your Spirit, our words are empty. Without your protection, our words are stressed. I pray that you will be with us with your Spirit, that your angels will walk up and down these aisles, put a hedge around us, and enlighten us with your thoughts. And may the words spoken be your words and not our words. In Jesus' name, amen. I've titled this sermon, Corporate Identity. And there are lots of aspects to corporate identity. And uh, we can start by looking at a typology in the Bible to see how corporate identity works. But I'll start with a verse. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 9 and 10. Even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak. For he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Now that's a fascinating verse when you think about it. And some of you might think that I'm going to preach a sermon on tithe. No, I'm not. I'm preaching a sermon on corporate identity. But listen to it again. Even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. And uh, Levi was only born 350 to 400 years after Abraham. So that is an interesting statement. So in a corporate sense, Levi, although he wasn't born yet, paid tithe in Abraham, so to speak. I want to look at another corporate identity in the Bible, and we find it in many, many stories. So I'm going to do one that is very well known, and we'll look at it from its various aspects. And I'm going to talk about the story of David and Goliath, and we read about it in 1 Samuel chapter 17, from verse 1. And uh, everybody knows the story of David and Goliath, and uh, it's a favorite story in children's books as well. But there's a very, very interesting aspect to the story that some of us might not have thought of before. It reads, now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shokoh, which belongs to Judah. And they pitched their tents and there was this conflict between the two armies. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, pitched by the valley of Elah, and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And now verse 3. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. So in a sense, this represents two kingdoms. The kingdom of God and the kingdoms of this world. So a mountain in the Bible is a kingdom. So you have these two entities opposed to each other, and in between a valley, a valley of conflict, a valley of battle, and in a sense a valley of decision. Verse 4, And they went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath. Now, Goliath is an interesting name, and it, it, it means a wine press. And uh, we read in the book of Revelation where Jesus says that he will tread the wine press alone. So there's an interesting connotation there. And this man came from Gath, and his height was six cubits and a span. Now, a cubit was the distance from the tip of your elbow to the tip of your finger. 
that of course could vary. <laughs> so from there approximately to there. And it was six cubits and a span. And a span was when you stretch your hand from the tip of the thumb to the little finger, that was a span. Now, it doesn't say in the Bible, but we can assume that Goliath probably had six fingers. Because we read about his brothers that had six fingers. So the whole family of giants seemed to have six fingers. So we have possibly two sixes here, whose height was six cubits and a span. There were six fingers in his span. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. There we have the number five. The number five in Scripture is associated with humanity. We have five senses, for example, and the number five occurs many times in connection with humanity. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. So we have three sixes in the story. Well, two and a possible six. Nevertheless, the number six is prominent. And maybe even six, six, six. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why you come out to set your battle in array? Am I not I a Philistine and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. Choose you a man. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. So here is a typical example of corporate victory. One individual wins and the battle is over. Everything is subject to the winning side. Now, that was what the Philistines said. That's not what the others said. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we might fight together. And when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now comes the story of David, the Ephratite, the one from Bethlehem, Judah, whose name, his father was Jesse, and he had eight sons, and the man went amongst men for an old man in the days of Saul. And the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to the battle, and the names of his three sons that went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and next it was Abinadab, and the third was Shammah. And David was the youngest, and the three elders followed Saul. So they were in the camp of Saul. They were in the camp of Israel. They were in the church. David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep. Now, there's another interesting side. So he's a shepherd. He's taking care of the sheep. The symbolism should be pretty clear to anyone who studies the Word of God. And the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. There's another interesting number. 40 days. We know that the fast of Jesus was 40 days. So there are some interesting parallels here. And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn and these ten loaves and run to the camp to thy brethren. So here is bread. Bread always has a spiritual connotation in the Bible. So here is the man who was taking care of the sheep and his father told him to go and take bread to the army. Interesting typology when we apply it to the church. And the number 10, of course, is interesting. 
10. Where do we find the number 10 in terms of spiritual food for God's people? Well, the law, of course. And carry these 10 cheeses unto the captain of their thousands, and look how thy brethren fare, and take their pledge. How thy brethren fare, and how they take their pledge. What does that mean? How serious are they about their involvement in the armies of Israel? How serious are they about this? Well, the story continues. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines and David rose up early in the morning, left the sheep with a keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. So he's obedient to his father. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to fight and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. Think spiritual. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. Of course, they were very cheered to see him. Just as Israel was very cheered when the Son of God, in obedience to the Father, came to present loaves to Israel. Unfortunately, no, no. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion of the Philistines, and uh, he said the same things that he said before. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man that is come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. There's a major typology in that one verse. There is a conflict with an enemy. That enemy is associated with the number 666. And here is the obedient son who has come to present the loaves, the bread of life, the issue of coming back into harmony with the government of heaven. And the reward, if he kills the enemy is to receive the daughter as his wife. So who does this daughter typologically represent? The church. The church. The victor gets the church. So if Goliath wins, the church is subject to Satan. If Christ wins, his church is subject to him. And the house of Israel will be set free. And David spoke to the men that stood with him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth the Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. So they repeat the story. If you kill him, the reproach of Israel will finally be removed, and there will be the wedding. The bride and the bridegroom will come together. Now, and Eliab, the eldest brother of heard this. This is now David's brother. So he's a fellow member in the church. When he spoke unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why camest thou down hither, and with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? Why don't you take care of your business? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that they might see the battle. 
You're a busybody, that's what you are. Whenever somebody is serious about the battle between good and evil, there will be someone to protest. And it'll always be a dear brother. And David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? And he turned from him towards another and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. Is there not a cause? And they said, well, yeah, <laughs> if you kill that guy, then this is what will happen. You will inherit the king's daughter. And when the words were heard which David spoke, they rehearsed them before Saul and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine and fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and I smote him and I slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. So if we look at it prophetically, this conflict has been raging for eons. The antitypical battle between the antitypical Goliath and the antitypical David is about to reach a peak. And yes, there were lion kingdoms and bear kingdoms. We read about them in the book of Daniel. And they have been destroyed because they tried to take the sheep out of God's flock. This battle has been raging for a long time. This taking care of the sheep while the lions and the bears and the incredibly horrible creatures come to destroy God's people. The Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. So Saul says to him, okay, go and put on my armor. David puts on his armor. He says, I can't fight in these. So he takes them off. We all know the story. And he goes to the brook and he chooses five smooth stones. Again, we have the number for humanity. Well, Goliath also had four brothers, so he had a stone for each of them. But the number five is important. And he put them into a shepherd bag, which he had, even in a scrip. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. And verse 42 says, And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. For he was but a youth and ruddy and of fair countenance. So what is the attitude of the enemy of God's people? He disdains them, despises them. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee and take thy head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air. And to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. So this victory, although it is a corporate victory in David, if he should win, 
doesn't follow the rule that Goliath said. Goliath said, if you win, we will serve you. If I win, you will serve us. But from David's side, there's no such compromise. From David's side, the story is, I will destroy you today. And all who clung to you will be destroyed with you. Because why should they serve such a different ideology? So in this battle, Christ wins all or nothing. There is no corporate victory in that sense, in this story. I come, thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear. We'll talk about that in a little while. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee, and I take thy head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the hosts of the Philistines, the whole host, this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth. And there you have the typology that you find in the book of Revelation, where there is this invitation to the supper of the birds, and where the wild beasts, the masses, the nations, the multitudes destroy the adversary. And then he says that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with the sword and the spear. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran towards the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and he took thence a stone and he slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead. The story goes that the Philistine probably pushed his helmet back to get a better view and he spoke, exposed the one part where he was vulnerable. And the stone sunk into the forehead and he fell upon the earth, face of the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Where was his sword if it was not in his hand? It was in his mouth. He said, Thus says the Lord. And that is the sword of the Spirit with which he smote the enemy. There is a God in heaven and he will bring this victory about. And it is with his mouth what he spoke where he condemned the Philistine. And he killed him with his own sword. We have a sword. It's called the sword of the Spirit. They have a sword which is called the secular arm, the force, the political entity that will enforce the dogmas and decrees so that you follow the anti-typical Goliath. But that sword that they wield will kill them eventually. And therefore he slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. Now the story gets very interesting. And the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until they came to the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way to Sharaim, even unto Gath and unto Ekron. So there was no compromise. And the children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistines, and they spoilt their tents. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. That's a fascinating verse. I'll read it again. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem. But he put the armor 
in his tent. So he took the armor and the sword and he took it home. Where was home? Home was in Bethlehem. That's where he lived. So he took it to his home in Bethlehem and he put it into his home. But the head he took to Jerusalem. But David never ruled in Jerusalem. Israel never ruled in Jerusalem at that time. The Jebusites were ruling in Jerusalem. They were the avowed enemies of Israel and of, and of David in the future. So why did he take the head of Goliath and take it to a nation that ruled in Jerusalem? Why did he take it there? Why did he not take it to his home? You see, it was the custom in those days that if you were a victor in a battle or in a war, then the victors would sever the heads of their enemies. The Assyrians were famous for it. If you look at the Assyrian reliefs, then you will find that their armies are depicted with piles of heads that have been cut off. And it was custom to take the head and take it of the prominent leader of the enemy and to take it to the next enemy and to put that enemy on notice, you're next. So David took the head and he took it to Jerusalem. Now I wonder where he took it. I wonder where he took it. So he goes to Jerusalem and he puts them on notice. Now when you did that, you didn't do it in a corner. You did it publicly. Just like the Philistine came out and stood on top of his mountain and defied the armies of Israel, so I assume that David also would have gone to a prominent hill overlooking Jerusalem with the head of Goliath and to put that enemy, that enemy of Israel on notice that something was going to happen. Now the Bible talks about a hill that we find in Jerusalem. And we read about it in Matthew 27, 33. And when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say a place of a skull, or some translations, the place of the skull. That's where they crucified Jesus. And they say this place looked like a skull. Well, maybe it did look like a skull. It still looks a little bit like a skull today. But it's the place of the skull. Is it possible that it is the very hill on which the skull, the head of the antitypical Goliath will be crushed and where the heel of the antitypical David will be bruised according to the promise in Genesis? Isn't this where the greatest victory, the antitypical victory of all time took place? Where the greatest corporate victory in the history of humanity took place? When he was lifted up, he was going to draw all men to him. And he would crush the head. But his heel would be bruised. Now I was in the museum in Israel where they have the exhibit. And there are only two, I believe, in the world of a foot that had been subject to a crucifixion. And the nail was driven through the heel. And not as we normally depict it from the front, but through the heels from the side and attached to the cross in that way. So is this possible? What kind of victory did Christ have on that cross? Even Levi, Hebrews 7 verse 9, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak. For he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. So typologically, 
Levi was in Abraham when Abraham paid tithe. So in type, Levi paid tithe in Abraham. Think about that. Now, humanity. Can we say that typologically all of us are in Abraham? Trick question, of course. The answer is no. The Sem Semites, or some of them, can possibly say that, those that are of the descendants of Abraham. But I can say that the whole of humanity, typologically, was present in Adam. So if we had to change this verse, then we could say that typologically each and every single one of us was in Adam when Adam fell. And so Adam corporately bears the responsibility for what happened to the human race. Adam cannot pass on to his posterity what is not his to pass on. He cannot. Adam lost eternal life when he transgressed in the Garden of Eden, and therefore he had no eternal life to pass on to his posterity. Adam no longer had an unfallen nature when he was in Eden after his sin. And so he cannot pass on to his posterity what is not his to give. So corporately, we all die in Adam. I hear so often that it is said, but that's not fair. Adam was the one who sinned, not me. So why should I suffer the consequences of Adam's demise? Why should I be responsible for that? And I always use the silly example. But a silly example is always very useful. Can I leave in my estate something like Edinburgh Castle to my children or Buckingham Palace? So that when they read my last will and testament, it says, My dear children, I have decided to leave you Edinburgh Castle and Buckingham Palace as your inheritance. Would they be exceedingly pleased with me? No, they would think the old man has gone insane. Because it's not mine to give. I cannot leave something to my posterity that doesn't belong to me. So in a sense, Adam couldn't leave an unfallen nature to his posterity when it wasn't his to give. He had lost it. He would gambled it away. I cannot leave my fortune that I had before my gambling debts to my children because I no longer have them. I've lost them. So in a corporate sense, all humanity dies in Adam. That's biblical. And we read in Romans chapter 9, verse 29, where it says, Unless the Lord of Sabbath, and as Isaiah said before, he's quoting Isaiah, unless the Lord of Sabbath had left us a seed, we would have become like Sodom and we would have been made like Gomorrah. Now, Sodom and Gomorrah in the Bible serves as the type of those who will be dying the second death. In other words, the death of eternal separation. And the text says, unless the Lord had left us a seed, singular, we would have all died the second death. We would have become like Sodom and Gomorrah. So this is the final destruction. Let's unpack it a little bit. In Luke chapter 8, verse 11, it says, Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. John 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Referring to Jesus. So the seed is the word of God, and the word was God. 
Galatians 3.16, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say unto seeds, plural, as of many, but as of one. And to your seed, who is Christ? So the corporate man, Adam, carried within him the seed of death, which he passed on to us. Now, before Adam fell, in who was he, corporately speaking, like Levi was in Abraham, in whom was Adam corporately before he was Adam? In Christ. Because the Bible says, he is the creator. For him and by him were all things created. So in a corporate sense, Adam, in his unfallen state, was in Christ. So corporately, the whole of humanity was in Christ. What does that make Christ? It makes him God. Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. So the only corporate man that has the whole of humanity corporately locked inside of himself is Jesus Christ in the unfallen state. Galatians 3.15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed and it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. So the battle corporately for the souls of men is a battle between Christ and Satan. Colossians 1.16 For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. Therefore, only in Christ could humanity be corporately present? Levi paid tithe, in a sense, corporately, in Abraham. Humanity, corporately, in a sense, was in Christ already before Adam was even created. Let's unpack this. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Now the Bible says that the sins of the fathers may not be transferred to the children, and neither may the sins of the children be transferred to the fathers. Each one is responsible for his own sin. But the doctrine of salvation says that Jesus Christ died for every single one of us. How can one man die for all without transgressing this principle? It's only possible in a corporate sense. The whole of humanity was corporately in Christ before Adam was even created. So how did Christ plan the plan of salvation? How did he put this together? How was it possible for the corporate man, the creator God, to come and pay the price for fallen humanity? Well, let's think about it. So he's the progenitor of all. So we could say before Adam... There was Jesus. Adam was in Christ. Romans 8 verse 3. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. This is a powerful verse. Let's read it again. 
for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. 2 Corinthians 5.21, for he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He took even fallen humanity into himself when he became part of fallen humanity. In his divinity, corporately, humanity was present in its unfallen state. In his flesh, humanity was present in its fallen state. This is an amazing Let's unpack it a little further. We read in the Review and Herald, By his obedience to all commandments of God, Christ wrought out a redemption for man. This was not done by going out of himself to another, but by taking humanity into himself. They were already in himself, in, in him corporately, before Adam was even created. Every single one, no matter what tribe or race or tongue or people, they were all there. Thus Christ gave to the humanity an existence out of himself to bring humanity into Christ, to bring the fallen race into oneness with divinity is the work of redemption. Now it gets even more fascinating. Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 252. In assuming humanity, Christ took the part of every human being. He was the head of humanity, a being divine and human. With his long human arm, he could encircle humanity, while with his divine arm, he could lay hold of the throne of the infinite. He took the whole of fallen humanity into himself because he, the corporate man, was the only being that could do it. Therefore, Christ has to be God. As Martin Luther said, the God who didn't die for me is not my God. It's not negotiable. The doctrine of the divinity of Christ is a doctrine that is not negotiable. Now it gets fascinating. The Lord can take every one of us into his embrace, for his arm encircles the race. Let us remember this. After Christ had taken the necessary steps, listen carefully, after Christ had taken the necessary steps in repentance, conversion, and faith, in behalf of the human race, he went to John to be baptized of him in the Jordan. And what did John say? Me? Baptize you? <laughs> it can't happen. I'm not worthy to, to untie your shoelaces, to tie your shoelaces. And Jesus answers him and says, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. This is astounding. And he comes up and he says a prayer. A corporate prayer for humanity. The Savior's glance seems to penetrate heaven as he pours out his soul in prayer. Well he knows how sin has hardened the hearts of men and how difficult it will be for them to discern his mission and accept the gift of salvation. He pleads with the Father for power to overcome their unbelief to break the fetters with which Satan has enthralled them, and in their behalf, to conquer the destroyer. He asks for the witness that God accepts humanity in the person of the Son, and never before have the angels listened to such a prayer. Never. Let me go back to the previous statement. After Christ, had taken the necessary steps in repentance, conversion, 
and faith. In behalf of the human race, he went to John to be baptized of him in Jordan. Excuse me. He was the sinless, spotless son of God. In him there was no guile. Satan had nothing on him. Why did he have to take the necessary steps towards repentance? He who had nothing to repent of, repented. The steps of faith and the steps of conversion. This is incredible. Repentance, conversion, and faith. Did Christ have to be converted? Absolutely not. Then why did he take the steps towards repentance, conversion, and faith? In a corporate sense, he did it in our behalf. He did it in, on my behalf. He did it on your behalf. Now here's the question. In this sinless, spotless Son of Man and Son of God, how perfect was that repentance? Immaculate. Without spot. Perfect. How perfect was that conversion? Immaculate. Spotless. Perfect. How perfect was his faith? Perfect, immaculate, spotless. He who had no need of those things did it. As verily as though he did it for me. So, in a sense, in a corporate sense, how perfect is my imperfect repentance and my imperfect conversion and my imperfect faith. How perfect is it in the corporate man? Absolutely immaculate. And in my stead, God the Father looks upon his Son and he sees corporately your and my Perfect repentance, conversion, and faith. So he didn't only die for me. He died as me. For the wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23 But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. You see, in humanity, in Christ, in, in Christ, all humanity died the second death. Paid the absolute price. Unless the Lord had left us a seed, we would have been like Sodom and Gomorrah. We would have died the second death. He paid the absolute price for you and for me. Hebrews 2 verse 16, For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. He took on him humanity. And he incorporated humanity in himself. He didn't die for angels. The Bible says that hellfire is prepared for the devil and his angels, not for humanity. There's a way of escape for humanity. There's a way out. He took on him not the nature of angels. Corporately, all angels are in him too because without him was nothing created that is created. So he created all the angels too. But the angels that fell from their higher state had no excuse. They were not deceived. So there was no sacrifice for them. But he became human. Why did he have to become human? Why did he leave heaven? Why did he leave the throne that he sat upon and 
lowered himself to the level of taking on the physical stature of fallen humanity. Why? Because that's the only way in which salvation can satisfy all the demands of the law. The wages of sin is death. And the sinner had to die. And there is nobody who can die for me. No angel, no human being, no great person, no superhero. Nobody can die for me because nobody is ever corporate in any one of those individuals. Only in Christ. Could they be corporately present? Acts 17 verse 25, Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. Romans 6 verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. The wages of sin is death. Jesus had no sin. But he has verily died the second death as any one of us would have to die it without him. Because he corporately died the death of total separation. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? One little sin. One tiny little transgression. The wages of sin is death. He would not have risen from the grave. And all of us would have forever been obliterated. The whole of heaven will have been robbed of its access to the Father. The whole of heaven was in jeopardy. And he who had no sin could not be held by death. Because the wages of sin is death. He had no sin. But he died corporately for every sin, single sin I have ever committed and every part of humanity has ever committed. And it crushed the life out of him that the blood poured through his skin. And had he not been sustained by an angel, he would not have survived. And because he was without sin, Death could not hold him. And he rose from, dead, from the dead. And corporately, having paid the price for every single one of humanity, he could rise in the newness of a transformed, restored Adam, as it were. The second Adam. And corporately, give unfallen stature to the whole of humanity. That's the plan of salvation. It is mind-bogglingly deep. It destroys the argument of the devil that there was no price that could be paid for humanity because the corporate man could pay it because we're baptized into his death. Romans 3 verse 25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. 2 Corinthians 5.14 For the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then were all dead. Corporately, 
in Christ, has humanity potentially paid the price, the wages of sin, yes or no? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's what the sex says. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. All of humanity corporately paid that price as verily as Levi paid tithe in Abraham. Knowing this, that the old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death has no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye selves dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, we rise and we receive a life that only the life giver can give. Another reason why it has to be God. Because he lays down his life and he takes it up again. He had no sin, therefore in his humanity he could rise. Divinity won't die, but the humanity could die. And the humanity was as verily God as the divinity was God. So in his humanity he rose and corporately rose with the whole of humanity. Does this mean there is universal salvation? No. That would make the other verses in the Bible obsolete, where there is a punishment and there is a condemnation for those who deny this great gift. So what is my contribution to this great plan of salvation? I was dead. A dead man can contribute nothing. You can go to a dead man and say, will you please do this or that and the other, you'll get no response. He's dead. There's nothing a dead man can do. And we were dead in transgression. There's nothing we can do. So only Christ could do in my behalf what I'm not able to do for myself. So where is boasting? It is excluded. It is excluded. Everything is a gift from God. Every single aspect of salvation. My faith my conversion, everything is a gift. Here are they who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Not the faith in Jesus. That's a correct, incorrect translation. The King James says, of Jesus. Because even that faith belongs to him and I have to take it as a gift. So in a corporate sense, we paid the price and now that I rise in him and have the gift of life what is my contribution by faith I appropriate it and my old man must die my old man has a propensity to resurrection and needs to be bludgeoned to death every single day of my life because if we be dead, we believe also that we shall live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death has no more dominion over him. So in a corporate sense, all of humanity is perfectly covered. The price has been paid. Now you have to appropriate it. For he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we may be made the righteousness of God in him. So he bore all my sin. He bore all my guilt. He bore all the consequences. And in him, I have a perfect conversion, a 
perfect repentance, a perfect faith, which is 100% acceptable to God. He who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, says 1 Peter 2 verse 22, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously, who his own self, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. This must be some of the most poetic writing that has ever been penned in the history of humanity. Ephesians 1.9, having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he has purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. One day in heaven, when the redeemed will be together with that unfallen, angelic host every single one of them would have been corporately in him even the angels because he is God and he created them and all of them will reflect his character so my contribution is to appropriate it and to die to self for in him we live and move and have our being as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are his offspring. Acts 17, 28. Now Isaiah has a beautiful summary of the plan of salvation. Let's look at it in the Old Testament. It sums it up in this way. Isaiah 45, verse 17 says, But Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. You shall not be ashamed nor confounded, world without end. Okay, so Israel shall be saved in the Lord. Verse 24 says, Surely shall one say, In the Lord have I righteousness and strength. There's righteousness by faith in the Old Testament. Verse 25, And the Lord, in the Lord, shall all the seed of Israel be justified and shall glory. So your salvation, your righteousness, your justification is a gift from God. So where is boasting? And please note the present tense. The present tense is very important here. In the Lord have I righteousness and strength. In him we are saved. In him. I can reject the gift and be lost because it's conditional to my acceptance by faith and my allowing him to exercise his obedience in me. But now, note what other translations do. 1 Corinthians 1.18 reads in the King James Version, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. When you go to the NIV, it reads, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. You see, Catholicism denies the atonement. Catholicism says Jesus didn't die for you. The Bible says he died for you as the corporate man. How perfect was that salvation? Was it a maybe? Did he die 99% for you? Did he die 80% for you? 70%? What's your contribution? 5%? 10%? 50 20 What's yours? Zero? Zero? So when they say, being saved, they make the plan of salvation a process. There's no such thing. 2 Corinthians 2.15 
For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ into them that are saved and in them that perish. There are two classes. Those who accept by appropriation the gift, by faith, and those who reject it. But those who accept it, it says, in them that are saved. Let's go to the NIV. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ amongst those who are being saved. That denies the atonement. That denies the perfect sacrifice of Christ. In Christ, salvation is always perfect, present tense. No maybe. He paid perfectly the price required. Salvation is absolutely certain in Christ. For everyone, no matter what race or tribe or people you belong to, or what religion you belong to, the only thing that is required is to believe that he did it and to accept it by faith. If you don't, then you are those that perish. For we are to God, says 2 Corinthians 15 in the, in the NIV, a pleasing aroma of Christ amongst those who are being saved. This is an incorrect theology. This is a Roman Catholic concept. Philippians 1.28, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation. And the NIV says, but to you who will, future tense, be saved. No. In Christ, the plan of salvation is perfect. There is not one iota of impossibility associated with him. If you are in Christ, Christ never talks of his people as dead. He talks of them as asleep because in him they are alive. If you are in Christ, you are a new creature and he lives in you. Your contribution is to die. And if you don't want to die, then you are not part of the contribution. The saved in Christ are thus not dead, but they live in him. We read in the desire of ages, God counts the things that are not as though they were. He sees the end from the beginning and beholds the results of his work as though it were now accomplished. Not tomorrow, not maybe. This condition which is anticipated in his purpose, he beholds as if it were already existing. The dead live unto him. The whole of humanity was on that cross. The whole of humanity typologically paid the price in him and he as verily paid it as though he were every single one of us. Can you contemplate that thought? So Christ in you is sanctification. And this is surrender unto Christ. Corporate salvation does not mean absolute universal salvation. There's a choice to be made. And this choice decides the outcome. And the evidence of whether the choice was real or whether the choice was not real lies in the fruits. How perfect must we become? As perfect as the perfect corporate man. Can I achieve it with a fallen nature? No. So all I can do to my fallen nature is to kill it. Destroy it. Paul says, how often does he die? Daily. Daily. This is a battle that will continue. When they looked upon Jesus, 
the Jews, they didn't see anything to attract. They did not admire such a life. They considered his religion worthless because it did not accord with their standard of piety. They decided that Christ was not religious in spirit or character for their religion consisted in display, in praying publicly, in doing works of charity to effect the most precious fruit of sanctification is the grace of meekness. They despised Jesus. What did Goliath do when he saw David? What did he do? The Bible says he disdained him. The world doesn't like this kind of religion. The world doesn't see any beauty in the death of self. The world sees only beauty in the exaltation of self. That's why we have stages of display and pomp and glamour. The world loves self-esteem. They write books about the power of self-esteem. That's the religion of the devil. But the meekness of Christ, who would want that? At that last supper, when two disciples were leaning on the breast of Jesus, one the disciple that Jesus loved, and the other one, the one who was going to betray him. And he washed the feet. And he must have come to Judas to wash his feet. And when Judas saw Jesus washing the feet of the disciples, something happened in him. Disdain. If you are the Messiah, if you are the King, if you are the Redeemer of Israel, if you are the one who's going to release us from the yoke of the Romans, how dare you lower yourself to the level of a servant? It is disdainful. Peter said, no, you will not do it to me. He says, if I do not do it, you have no part in me. Well, then what's the whole lot? And he says, but you've already been cleansed. You've been baptized. You've only picked up dirt along the road. Let me wash your feet. Let me give you a mini baptism. They were all arguing with one another, every single one of them, as to who was going to be the greatest. And the greatest of them all took a towel and washed their feet. And Judas felt disdain. And John felt humbled. And that's the difference between salvation and death. What do we feel when we come into contact with the echelons of power and how it is wielded? We must look to Christ for his examples. Christianity purposes a reformation in the heart. What Christ works within will be worked out under the dictation of a converted intellect. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying Abba. John, when he looked at Jesus, saw something. He saw a nobility in humility that changed his mind and his heart forever. What kind of spirit must we have in order to see nobility in humility? It's not part of the human capacity. We're not designed like that in our fallen state. So when Christ works in us, the works that we do are not our works. My contribution has nothing to do with it. My contribution is only death because my contribution would be steeped in selfishness. Even my good deed of giving to someone who is poor, it's not 
too disdainful if someone should find out how kind and sweet you were. But works that are really of Christ are real works of humility. I cannot work them because mine are always tainted with a percentage of self. Only Christ can work perfect works. Only Christ. So any form of legalism, any form of boasting, any form of saying, look how good I am, comes straight out of the mouth of the antitypical Goliath. It can never be our work. It must always be his work. Death cannot resurrect me. Only the life giver can resurrect me. A fallen state cannot produce something clean. Only something clean can produce something clean. The closer we come to Jesus, the more faults we will see in our own lives. We will see our faults more clearly as we compare our sinful selves with the perfect Savior. This will show that Satan's false ideas are losing their power over us and that the life-giving Spirit of God is leading us. There is a work to be wrought in us. Constantly we must submit our will to God. Our peculiar ideas will strive constantly for the supremacy, but we must make God all in all. We are not free from failings of humanity, but we must constantly strive to be free from these failings. Not to be perfect in our own eyes, but perfect in every good work. We must not dwell on the dark side. Our souls must not rest in self, but in the one who is all and all. John 6, 28. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? This is an important question. What must we do to work the works of God? If everything I do is tainted, Jesus answered and said unto him, This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he has sent. It's only by faith. Only by faith. By looking constantly into the mirror of the law and seeing my defects. This is not a popular religion. John 19 verse 5, Then came Jesus forth wearing a crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said unto them, Behold the man. What pictures are hanging in your hallways when you walk through the hallway of your life? What are the pictures you see? The pictures of your failings? I could pack my hallway with my failings round and round and round and dwell on the failings of my fallen nature and I could dwell on my character defects, and I could become discouraged. Or I can look upon the victories that were gained for me on the cross, and I could ask God to take away the victories of Goliath in my life and to replace it with the victories of the antitypical David in my life and walk in newness of spirit because the corporate man paid the price for me and as me as verily as if I had died with him on that cross, corporately speaking. There's no place for boasting in this religion. Micah 6 verse 8 says, He has showed thee, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of thee? but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. Let no one rob you of your faith. Let no one rob you of your salvation. Let no one tell you that you are not good enough because in Christ you are perfect, absolutely immaculate. And if you look at yourself, then say to yourself, it doesn't look perfect. Then pick up the plug 
the, the uh, bracket, the whatever, the, the bat, and destroy the old man of sin. Because in him we live and move and have our being. Amen. YouTube. I'm Walter Feit from Amazing Discoveries. If you'd like to learn more or you would like to subscribe, then click visit our webpage, donate, share, and we would like to hear from you.